to have survived another week and to be together and especially to be together with such a fabulous worship band. Yes. One answer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much to everybody who worked hard to clear the streets and to clear our driveway. Dennis did that. And to, to um, clear the parking lot. We are they work so hard, don't they, to get rid of that snow, and we are very, very, very thankful for that, too. Um, congratulations and thank you to the girls and to the boys' basketball teams and the wrestlers and to our hockey player, too, as they have wrapped up another season or are in the process with playoffs of wrapping up another season. And I'm always cognizant of leaving out the other school activities because I myself was never an athlete. So thank you also to the music department, the FFA, and everybody, all the rest of you at school. We are, we are very thankful to be included in your lives. It, that's the, the best part of it being in a small community, isn't it? We're all together, all together, no matter what age we are. Um, Lennis' heart surgery was successful, and we are happy to report that he and fellow Grandpa John are recovering together at the Heart Hospital in Sioux Falls. So thank you for all of your thoughts and your prayers for, for all of our sick people all the time, and prayers of thanksgiving go up to Lennis, or to God for Lennis and for John. Otherwise, other announcements, you will have to look at them yourselves in your bulletin. Shelly will be gone on a much-needed vacation for the next week, so if there's something that you needed from the office, I probably think you're probably just going to have to wait. <laughs> huh? Oh, your brother-in-law passed away. Oh, sympathy to you and to your sister. Yep, yep. Yeah, um, thank you. Ash Wednesday is a treasured and valuable introduction to the season of Lent. And as the Bible teaches, God is not limited by time or space. So we are going to celebrate Ash Wednesday next Wednesday. We will be having our traditional stone soup supper then too. So I hope that you can all join us there. As our reflections for Ash Wednesday suggest, there is often a strong temptation to turn inward on ourselves, to, to ponder our own piety or our record of service or righteousness, or ask more deeply, how am I doing on this journey of faith? But the good news of what was achieved for us through Christ's death and resurrection overrides all of that and forces us into a different direction. And so today we focus our attention on the word and the promises of God, 
forgiveness of sin, life, and salvation. Our opening was wonderful. We are indeed so, so blessed. So please rise as we begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Share the peace with one another. That's peace to you all, girls. Peace, peace, peace. That's peace to you. That's peace to you. We begin with our confession. Left side, we have not loved you with all our hearts. Right have, side, we have we not have loved our neighbors, our neighbors as ourselves. We, we have not responded to your, your promise. We have put up walls to keep people at a distance. We have, we have failed to respond when someone is hurting. We have not responded to your promise. We are captured by our desire for material wealth. We, we forget those who do not have food or shelter. We have, we have not responded to your promise. We abuse the gifts of your creation. We destroy your beauty out of ignorance and greed. We have not responded to your promise. We fail to respond to your call to do justice. We seek only comfort for ourselves. We have not responded to your promise. but God's promises are not through the life, death, and resurrection of our Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven. Your 
together the prayer of the day. Lord God, our strength, the struggle between good and evil rages within and around us, and the devil and all the forces that defy you tempt us with empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word, and when we fall, raise us again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we hear the lessons. First reading is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, and chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you, sh you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. There's some children who want to come forward for a little message. Now is your time, and can you guys help me? I forgot to ask you before. <clears throat> Look at you all. Look at you all. Do you like games? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you do. Have you ever heard of this game? Do you know what it is? You don't know what it is? It is. It's pin the tail on the donkey. And can you guys hold it up, please, for me? There you go. Pin the tail on the donkey. I have a bunch of grandkids and a couple years ago we played a whole bunch of games at Charlie's birthday party and we had a pinata and we had this game and we had um, hot potato and just all kinds of fun games. So how do we do this game? How do you do that? Is that seems pretty easy to me. You just pull it off and you put it on. 
blindfolded. Ooh, that's a little trickier, isn't it? To have a volunteer to help me try it. You want to try it? And you try Okay, two of you can try it one at a time, though. Just will you two. And maybe we'll have to play it afterwards, too, do you think? Okay, stand up. Oh, now you're too tall for me. Okay, turn around. There you go. Okay. And then we twirl him around, don't we? Twirl him around so he's not totally 100% sure even where, whoops, where the tail is. Can you see? Can you see? Can you see what he's doing? Not very well. Okay, I've got, here's, here's the tail. Can you hold it up a little higher, please? Okay. Here's the pin. Here's the tail. Got it? Okay, twirl around. One, two, three. And now we'll twirl you around the back. Wait. Okay, pin the tail on the donkey. What? Can you see through that blindfold? Are you sure? Wow, take it off and look. You are wrecking my children's sermon. <laughs> you like a try? I think we have. We, who said first, though? Caddy, okay. I think, I think he said first, didn't you? Okay. It's fun, isn't it? It's fun. Okay, turn around. And tell me if you see through this mask. Can you see? <laughs> okay. Can you see? Are you sure? Okay. Here's your, here's your, I'm going to give you the pin. Got it? Okay. One, two, three. Okay, we'll turn around backwards. Okay, pin the tail on the donkey. <laughs> Wrong donkey, huh? <laughs> You're not supposed to be able to see. Yeah. Forward. Find the. Oh, you're feeling it. <laughs> Just poke it in. Do you want to see? You lost your tail. It fell off your pin. Okay. Do you want to see or do you want it back on? Want to try it? Oh, he wants to try it. Yep, go ahead. No, uh, no, 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 put it in. No. Just put it in. No, uh, you did pretty close, <laughs> didn't he? He did pretty close. Show the congregation where he got it. You did pretty good, didn't you? You did really good. Oh, my goodness. So, remember last week? We, we may have to do it at coffee hour. Is that okay? Okay. Right after church. Yeah, where the snacks and goodies are? Yeah, yeah. So remember how last week we talked about sometimes it's a crazy world out there where people are telling you different ways to do different things and you don't know who to listen to? Yeah, you were kind of doing that again, weren't you? Did you have trouble listening to all the people? You didn't know which way to go? A little bit? No, you did okay? Well, in our story today that I'm going to read in a few minutes, Jesus had the devil telling him different ways to go. And what do you suppose Jesus did? 
He didn't listen, did he? No, he didn't listen at all. He remembered who he needed to listen to, and who is that? Yes, he needed to listen to God, didn't he? Because when we listen to God, what happens? We feel right inside, don't we? Sometimes things aren't so right outside, but it's always right inside because God loves you more than anybody in the whole, whole world. So he's only going to choose what's best for you. So let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, so much for teaching us who to listen to and why to listen to you. Thank you for loving us. Please bless us and everybody in our house this day and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can have a turn afterwards out in the, in the fellowship hall. Um, you can just put it over by you if you want to. Thank you. I don't know if you heard it. He says, why didn't everybody get a turn? <laughs> I didn't think of that. I didn't think of that. Um, please, now, as you are able. Oh, our band plays something, don't you? Song of the Word. Help us, Lord. And we rise? Okay. And we rise. It's our gospel introduction. Gospel according to Matthew, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him upon the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels c concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Once again, I bring you grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. I love how this gospel lesson ends. And angels came and waited on him. Do you believe in angels? What do you think of when you think of angels? Now, the precious ones we see here at Christmas time under the star with baby Jesus for sure. Christmas is big for angels, isn't it? 
angels from the realms of glory and angels we have heard on high. And who could forget Clarence on It's a Wonderful Life? Every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. We actually get much of what we think we know about angels from entertainment. Some of you might be old enough to remember that early 90s television show, Touched by an Angel, or even through reruns probably, the earlier 1980s Highway to Heaven. They were kind of precursors to a more contemporary God friend in me, only I don't think that there are angels in that one. <laughs> Maybe God doesn't need angels anymore with the internet, huh? So on the flip side, how about the devil? Do you believe in the devil? Well, when we see an adorable little boy with a lot of spunk, we lovingly say he's got a little devil in him, don't we? The devil made me do it, we joke. And there are sure a lot of devils running around at Halloween with horns and red capes and pitchforks, aren't there? We don't talk much about the devil the rest of the year. Angels have the last line in today's gospel lesson, but the devil plays a much bigger part beginning at the beginning in Genesis when he, in the guise of a serpent, not so innocently asks the woman about God. Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Yeah, that was a dumb question. Eve must have thought, do I look like I'm starving? No, she tells him, we can eat the fruit of all of the trees, all except the one in the middle. Then she adds, exaggerating, as some of us are wont to do, and we can't even touch that tree or we will die, opening the way for the devil's work. Now, God didn't say they couldn't touch it. Eve knew that, the devil knew that, and he stuck his big foot in the crack she created to further expand his case. Really? Surely you won't die. There must be some other reason God doesn't want you to eat from that tree. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. That tree is the one that will open your eyes. God doesn't want you to eat of that tree because he knows that you will be like God and you will know all. Now Eve knew God personally, in person, yet she fell for it. She was only human, and humans were created in the very beginning, like all creatures, with a strong sense of self-preservation, which the devil exploited. And we all know how that turned out, don't we? The sin wasn't in the eating, but in the doubt. By taking advantage of Eve's sense of self-preservation, the devil instilled doubt that God was truly on her side, that God only wanted good for her. Satan provided fodder for the notion that maybe she needed to play a role in caring for herself, spiritually, as well as physically. Temptation is serious business, is it not? And it was so, even for Jesus. The Bible says that immediately after his baptism, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. God didn't set him up in a temple or in a palace after resting his spirit upon him. God sent Jesus out into the wilderness, into the world, to be tempted. Some translations substitute tested for tempted, and maybe that's closer to the point. You may stretch, and you may lift weights, and you may study the rules, but as our athletes know, you don't leave it at the gym. You play the game. Jesus was in the wilderness to play the game. And the bottom line was, would he win? Would he passively trust God's word, you are my beloved son, and all that means, or would he succumb to the devil's taunts and attempt to take control for himself, as did Eve? Temptation number one was physical. Food. He was hungry. Forty days and forty nights he fasted. He had the power, so what's the big deal? 
Any of us who have attempted to follow a healthier lifestyle can readily identify with this one, can't we? For me, it's the chips in the bottom cupboard. I love chips, I think to myself in the evening, and I'm hungry. And I'm a grown-up for crying out loud. If I want chips, I'll have chips. That's oversimplifying it a bit, of course, but you get the picture. Jesus had just heard that he was God's son. The devil was asking him, as God's son, why should you have to be hungry? You have the power. Bam, rocks to roast beef. Eat, eat. Who would know? And who would know is not the point, is it? It's not about who would know or even about the food itself. It's about who does Jesus listen to? And can this sneaky guy make him question God's provision? Temptation number two. Prove it. The devil is baiting Jesus. Remember the kid in the Christmas story movie who stuck his tongue on the icy flagpole? Why did he do it? I double dog dare you, followed by the sinister triple dog dare. The devil was triple dog daring Jesus to throw himself off that temple peak then and there. All of Jerusalem would see him then as the son of God when the angels came and caught him and he could live a life of ease and respect that he deserved and not have to put up with this wilderness hunger business ever again. The sneakier side of this is that the devil was suggesting Jesus needed to prove himself, prove to himself that God had chosen him, prove to himself that God loved him. Refusing to do this would suggest that Jesus is unafraid or unsure. But Jesus doesn't buy it. He knows that this isn't about proving anything. Life is about faith. And faith trusts without proof. Temptation number three, the goal. The devil is offering Jesus a shortcut to everything that Jesus wants and has come to do. As he looks out over the kingdoms of the world, Jesus sees their pain. It's a foreshadowing of the end of his ministry when he grieves over Jerusalem, saying, How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks, and you were not willing. The devil is offering to accomplish for him then and there everything that Jesus came to do, all the kingdoms full of all the hurting people in the world. The devil says, I can give them to you to do with whatever you want. You can save them in a blink of an eye if you choose to do so right now. <laughs> That's a heck of a shortcut, huh? Who doesn't like a shortcut? In our world today, it seems that more often than not, we truly believe the end justifies the means. We all crave some degree of love, money, and power, don't we? Shortcuts abound for all three, and the lengths we will go to to achieve. safer since 40 to 50 percent of all marriages end in divorce anyway. Shortcut to money for the things that we want to have and to do. Some studies assert that the typical American family owes $155,038. That's debt. Wow. And how about a shortcut to power? Knowing what and when to compromise, we're told, is the way to make friends and influence people. That's another way of saying the same advice my mom used to give me when she thought I was being a little bit too intense about things. You catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. <laughs> the bottom line is, who wants flies? We know these things are wrong, yet they give us what we want in the short term anyway, don't they? More quickly, more easily. We might justify them by looking at the end result, but will the end result last? Or are we, like Eve, 
thinking that God, that being like God would be better off than being with God. Jesus didn't take Hence, Jesus wasn't afraid to commit. And Jesus knew that he could afford to wait upon his Father for all good things in the Father's good time. Jesus did not fall to temptation. He used scripture to remind the devil and himself who he was and whose he was. But we need to remember that this passage is not given to us as a prescription to follow. Scripture isn't a plan to keep us out of trouble. It's not an early warning system like stock up on groceries, a blizzard's coming, or get out of the house if the smoke alarm goes off. Scripture is not what saves you. It's not how well you avoid the pitfalls or how smart you are that saves you. What saves you is that Jesus remained faithful to his Father, to his mission, to his promise to you. Jesus' baptism drove him into the wilderness, and by way of the cross, that same baptism drove him to you. There were no shortcuts, and there are no shortcuts. The power of your baptism drives you to him, into his arms, into repentance, and into faith itself that knows God is always, always going to be there for you into life everlasting forever and ever, where maybe, just maybe, there will be angels to wait on you too. People of God, you are ready to play this game. So what's stopping you? You can't lose. Remember, you too are blood-bought sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So get out there and act like it. Amen.
rise and confess with me our faith in the words of the statement of faith that we have on our screens. We believe God is our creator and has promised to love us always. We believe Jesus Christ, fully God and fully human, is God's promise among us. He experienced all the pain and joy and challenges of human life. God's forgiving love was revealed to us when Jesus suffered death on the cross. He came back to new life and has promised us new life in unity with God. We believe the Holy Spirit is God's promise touching our spirits, guiding us even through the darkest and most difficult moments of our lives. We believe God is among us in community, mysterious yet very real. God promises to be with us always, even to the end of the age. You may be seated and we continue our worship with our offering, beginning with the children and their offering. In response to your promise of life, we offer our life. In response to your promise of love, we offer our love. 
In response to all of your promises, we offer our gifts. Amen. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. You alone are God. Sustain your church in times of wilderness. Give vision and wisdom to bishops, their staff, and all entrusted with the ministry of administration, especially our bishop, Constanza, and the staff of the South Dakota Synod. Counsel all who seek to faithfully lead your people into the future. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You create verdant gardens and expansive deserts. Tend to the needs of every living creature. Bless those who work in fields and orchards, farms and ranches, that the world is nourished by the fruits of their labor. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You know our temptations. Sustain those who govern and legislate, our President Joe Biden, our Governor Christy Noem, and all who work with them for the good of all. Instill in them a sense of your mercy and righteousness, that equity and peace would pervade all the regions and nations of the world. Merciful God, you are a hiding place for all in distress. Draw near to exiles and accompany all refugees and immigrants, especially children who have been left alone. In times of trouble, trauma, or illness, surround your people with your steadfast love, especially those of our own hearts. Lennis, John, Shirley, Samantha, Kathy, Homer, Karen, Valerie, Wanda, Tim, Larry, Jacob, Adeline, Pauline, Sue, Betty, Jason, Jake, and those we name silently now before you. Merciful God, you offer abundance to all. Bless the ministries of hospitality in this place. Care for all of those who volunteer to tend to the needs of others, both here and in the community. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You alone are God. We praise you for the faithful departed in every age. Unite our prayers with theirs until our wilderness journey is complete also, and we rest in you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O oh God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Spirit intercedes for us with sighs to deep or words to
Let's go out with God's love to nurture us, with God's peace to comfort us, and with God's truth to guide us, remembering God's promise to be with us always. Oh